welcome to another edition of North Shore Journal. I'm your host, Walt Kosmowski, and I'm very honored to have as my guest today our state senator from Methuen, Diane DiZoglio. I pronounce it the American way, right? Not Dizolio, as they would in, in Sicily. You can pronounce it however you like. <laughs> Both are correct to me. Uh, but yes, Diana Dizoglio, thank you so much for having me here today in Beverly Walt. It's my, 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 my humble honor. My, my pleasure. And we are going to be talking today about uh, the Merrimack River. And uh, this is a topic that's been in the, in the headlines in the papers uh, for the last couple of years. Uh, and just, just as, a, uh, as a point of reference... Uh, I'm going to tell our audience that in 2018, 800 million gallons of raw and partially treated sewage, along with rainwater, was dumped into the Merrimack River by some sewage processing plants along, along the river. Mm -hmm. uh, and you uh, were the primary sponsor of a bill to create uh, what's called the Merrimack River District Commission. And we're going to talk about that and its, and its role. But just so our viewers can kind of uh, look at the big picture and, and get a, an idea of what we're talking about. Uh, Zach, maybe you can put up the, the diagram of the watershed of the Merrimack River, and we'll take a little look at that. And here we have uh, the state of New Hampshire and northern part of Massachusetts. And if you look at the Merrimack River, uh, coming down from, from the north, you have the Pemigewasset River, and Squam Lake actually uh, uh, empties into the Merrimack, Lake Winnipesaukee does, um, and it goes through Concord, Manchester, Nashua, and New Hampshire. And then you see also all the way from the, um, um, from the reservoir, the Wachusett Reservoir, and that flows kind of northeastern into the Merrimack and on through Lowell, Lawrence, and Haverhill. And the uh, river empties in at Newburyport into the Atlantic Ocean. So from terms of a watershed, it looks, I'm, I'm just <coughs> guessing, uh, at least a third, maybe half of the state of New Hampshire uh, is uh, part of the watershed. And then the northeastern uh, part of the state of Massachusetts all the way out to the center part, Wachusett's Reservoir. And you can see the city of Boston there. So we're talking about a river that drains uh, quite a piece of geography, Senator, correct? Yes. Yeah. Now, you're, you're, um, uh, you're centered in Methuen, but tell us what your uh, state senatorial district comprises. So I represent Methuen, North Andover, Haverhill, Salisbury, Merrimack, Amesbury, and Newburyport, uh, right along the 495 corridor, okay. actually. And um, I was a state representative, actually, for six years before deciding to run for the state Senate. And I had, at that time, represented portions of four different cities and towns, Methuen, Lawrence, North Andover, um, and Haverhill. And during that time, I, I heard about issues with the Merrimack River. I was born and raised in Methuen, uh, you know, pretty much a lifelong resident, you know, except for college, a little bit of traveling in my early 20s, lifelong resident in the Merrimack Valley. And I've always heard about issues with the Merrimack River and, you know, the needs of the Merrimack River and the challenges with the Merrimack River. But I, when I became a state senator, heard about it in such a different capacity. Um, you know, I, I knew that there were issues with sewage, but I wasn't really getting calls as a state rep years ago regarding these sewage spills because I didn't represent the communities where all the sewage spills were actually dumping out to. Right. And now as a state senator, I do. Uh, communities like Newburyport, you have Salisbury, you have, um, you know, uh, everything's going right down the river there and just dumping out into the ocean. It's really impacting these communities, especially these coastal communities. Obviously, it's impacting all of us who live along the river. Right. But especially in these coastal communities, uh, it's particularly egregious for them because they're swimming in the beach at the end of, right. you know, at the end of the line. So... Uh, it's been like, you know, pun intended, drinking water out of a fire hose. <laughs> and there's been a lot of information that I have learned during the past year or so since taking on this new role as state senator. And I have been contacted by the Merrimack River Watershed Council, by the Clean River Project, by the Charles River Watershed Council, uh, by the Mass Rivers Alliance in Massachusetts, and by local advocates in my community, by local officials in my community, 
the mayors, the town managers, the city councilors, and also just by residents, residents who live on the river, r residents who live on the beach, or residents that just live in the community that maybe get their drinking water from the Merrimack River and right. who are concerned. Right. Also residents who use the Merrimack River for recreation. So all of a sudden during the last year, year and a half, I started getting these phone calls and these emails in this new capacity in representing these communities. And in that educational experience from talking to all these people, realized that a lot of people were talking and a lot of people were concerned, but there weren't conversations that were actually crossing community borders. Uh, for example, you know, Newburyport was, uh, you know, under the, the, the great leadership of Mayor Donna Holliday, uh, making tremendous strides in their efforts in, in, in dealing with this, this sewage issue. And they had had conversations about it, and they were working with their local elected officials and advocacy groups. But then you had Lowell, and then you had, you know, right. all the way up in New Hampshire, and you had Haverhill, right. and you have all these, and, and you know, Manchester and Nashua and all these places. Sort of working like a, in a silo. Right, sort of working a thing, in yeah. silos that weren't able to really connect with each other, that all were talking about the issue, yeah. but weren't, didn't really have an opportunity to connect with one right. another because of their responsibilities and actually doing their jobs during the day, right. managing cities, managing the water treatment plants, managing the advocacy groups, right. so on and so forth. Right. And so you, I, I created this group yeah. in order to, it's called the Merrimack River District Commission, and I created this group uh, through the legislative process, through a funding source in the state budget during the last Senate budget that we voted on. Senator Lovely was a tremendous advocate <laughs> and a great support, I have to say that, we're here in Beverly. <laughs> Senator Lovely was a huge help in this effort and uh, you know strongly supported this and voted to support and I, and this I will, I will along with your your local representatives I know you have Jerry Paracelli Jerry here. Yeah. Uh, but I filed this in the Senate budget and we were able to secure fifty thousand dollars to create this Merrimack River District Commission which is a local collaborative group of stakeholders businesses residents and local officials and experts from throughout the Merrimack Valley all along that watershed okay. for the Merrimack and we're gonna, we're gonna talk a little bit more about that, but to put this into perspective, you know, I, I quoted that the, 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 the amount of, of sewage that's dumped in, and one of the things that you learned and that our viewers will be quite surprised to hear is that this, this effluent, this overflow of raw sewage, it actually does not violate any laws. It's perfectly legal because uh, um, um, the, the, um, um, the, 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 Consent agreements that the EPA has signed with these treatment plants predates the Clean Water Act. Under the Clean right. Water Act, you wouldn't be able to do this. But uh, they, the EPA has uh, uh, had these agreements with these power plants. It's, it's like six or seven, not power plants, but sewage treatment plants, six or seven of them. And they can actually dump this in into the river, and, and it's perfectly legal right now, correct? Unfortunately... It is happening in that manner, and the reality of why we need groups like the Merrimack River District Commission to continue and to be funded is because we need to make sure that we have a consistent set of short-term goals and long-term goals that are on the table for us to examine. Short-term goals are things like making sure that we are notifying residents if there is a sewage spill in the river and making sure that we are funding cleanup efforts along the river, uh, making sure that we are... Uh, conducting these these systems of pre-notification that we're working on now. I secured some funding to create um, a, a pilot program for a flagging system that will actually be piloted for the entire state. It'll be piloted in the city of Newburyport where they'll have pre-notifications saying, uh, you know, today it's going to rain. There probably is going to be a significant amount of rainfall. We might want to be careful about combined sewage overflow into the river. Uh, those are short-term goals, is these, these notification systems, these pre-notification systems, and these cleanup efforts. In the long term, though, Walt, what we need to do is we need to make sure that we're focusing on changing these regulations, on holding those responsible accountable, and on making sure that the EPA, that the DEP in the here in Massachusetts, is doing their job, but also making sure that we are fighting for those federal funds to do the necessary infrastructure updates in the communities to fix the outdated sewage systems. So you talk about the Clean Water Act, right, back in the 1970s. Before that, I mean, people talk about the Merrimack River now, but remember back 
before the Clean Water Act. I wasn't around, <laughs> <laughs> believe it or not. Uh, but but I've read about it, and I've and I've spoken with experts, and I've spoken with people who were, and they tell me that the river was filthy and it smelled at all times, and you couldn't swim in it, and it was just you know sewage being dumped in and trash being dumped in, and with mill cities all along the river as well, you know you have the 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 benefit of having the mill cities and the benefit of all the job creation and development that was happening you know, way back in the day when those mills were being used. But then you also have the unintended consequence of the pollution that came from those mill buildings being dumped into these waterways. So when the Clean Water Act happened and we saw the influx of federal dollars come back into this region and in, into, into Massachusetts as a whole, you saw these waterways get cleaned up significantly. And now today we have a river where people are paddle boarding and people are kayaking and people are boating and they're swimming and they're able to recreate. So it's a lot better. And I don't, and I would be remiss not to mention, you know, the, the, the progress that's been made through the years, but it certainly isn't enough. And we need to make, continue to, to make the Merrimack River cleaner and safer and healthier for all. And that yeah. is going to take the continued focus on the short-term goals and the long-term goals, which are the infrastructure updates to prevent the sewage spills from happening right. in the first place. But the reason why I say federal dollars is because we can put state funding into this and continue to put state funding into this. We got a million dollars in state funding working with the Merrimack Valley uh, legislative delegation at the State House, working with your state reps and your state senators here. Uh, we were able to secure a million dollars to come back to the Greater Lawrence Sanitary District water treatment plant. Now, they had secured a million dollars in funding from a different source. The state chipped in a million dollars, and we were able to make sure that they um, have a generator that, when the power goes out, will help them to keep their systems going so that there's not a sewage spill into the yeah. river. That's a tremendous step in the right direction. We were able to do that with state resources. Great. We need the federal dollars, though, because guess what? We can't control what's happening up in New Hampshire with these state resources. Right. And we let me, as state let me legislators can only, can only yeah. fight so, so gonna, hard at the state level. I'm going to so. ask Matt to, uh, you mentioned the federal dollars and the EPA, and I'm going to ask Matt just to kind of zero in. This is actually um, uh, less than two weeks old, and if he could zoom in on that. Uh, and uh, this is uh, Congressman uh, Moulton and Trahan are looking for, maybe you could zoom in on the, on the headline, Matt. Um, uh, and they're looking for uh, uh, EPA money, and I believe there's a certain amount of money has been, has been released, has it not, for, for cleanup uh, for this, specifically for the Merrimack? According uh, to the articles that I've read, again, I'm not, just not being a member of the federal delegation, um, I'm, I'm going by the same things that you are reading. Yeah. I can say uh, I have been working specifically with Congresswoman Trahan on these efforts. Yeah. Uh, she's my congresswoman. Yeah. And uh, she has been fighting tooth and nail every day to make sure that we are getting the funds that we need back to these efforts. But it's challenging in D.C. at the moment, as uh, many viewers at home may have noticed. Uh, there is a lot of gridlock happening in Washington right now. And no matter what side of the aisle you're on, I think everybody can agree that there's gridlock in D.C. right now, and that prevents a lot of good policies that I think are bipartisan policies that should get support from everybody. Uh, the gridlock in D.C. right now prevents a lot of these good policies from getting passed. So again, we're, we're fighting to get these things passed at the state level. We're working with our federal partners to try to ensure that these policies are passed, that the EPA is held accountable that the federal dollars are sent back to Massachusetts to help with these infrastructure updates along our waterways. But we need to keep advocating uh, in the long term for those goals. And things like the Merrimack River District Commission, which keep everybody focused and at the table in a consistent and concerted effort, is what it's going to take in the long term to make sure that our vision regarding the Merrimack River becomes a reality. Yeah. And in this, in this article, I'll just read a comment here by uh, Congressman Pappas. Uh, he said, quote, it is incomprehensible that in the year 2020, untreated sewage still flows into America's waterways, which is the, the statistic we read uh, uh, earlier. And this is something that goes to another comment. This is something that, and this was written uh, um, by the um, uh, members of the committee. 
The scale of need to protect the Merrimack and the communities in its watershed requires a major investment of federal grant support. So uh, you're right. Ha has Both there... of those statements are correct. Yeah. Now, now you mentioned a, a couple other entities, which, uh, and let me let me just ask you. You you mentioned the Merrimack River Planning Commission, and your district, your Merrimack River District Commission, would fall under their auspices, or or how, how would that how would that work? Yes, well, we needed somebody to facilitate uh, locally the district commission that was created at the legislative level at the state house. So the Merrimack Valley Planning Commission uh, stepped up to the plate and offered to facilitate these meetings moving forward and to make sure that everybody was contacted and brought together. And actually, since their director, Karen Connard, wonderful executive director for the planning commission, since she has since taken the position of uh, city manager in the city of Portsmouth, uh, New Hampshire. Whoa. Uh, President Lane Glenn of Northern Essex Community College and an Amesbury resident in the district that I represent, the First Essex District, uh, he has actually stepped up to the plate to assist in the efforts alongside of the Planning Commission to facilitate the meetings of this district commission. So this is something that's truly bringing the community together. Uh, you have the local community college president stepping up to the plate, um, who is offering his services and uh, you know bringing in the perspective of students and faculty and all of that into the mix and all of his connections uh, there in, in higher education to the table. And then you have the, the uh, regional planning commission, which brings all of the people who are experts in planning and in design uh, engineers, so on and so forth, to the table to assist in these efforts. And they're working together collaboratively, Walt, to bring members of the community together to talk about their concerns, to share their viewpoint and their aspect on things, and to make sure that this conversation continues until we see results. But what you said in that article, when you were just reading those two quotes, it's so true, uh, especially what uh, um, Congressman Papa said when he was talking about the uh, the fact that it's, you know, basically saying it's unacceptable that this is still happening, that this infrastructure has not been updated yet. And for those at home who don't know, who are listening, you know, it's important to say that um, if, if you, you know, if you're not an engineer or whatnot, like I'm not, <laughs> you, you have to learn about how these, how these systems work. And I remember getting elected to the state senate, you know, and, and I, even as a state rep and saying, you know, well, why were these systems created this way if they don't work? Well, at the time when they were built... They did work, right, back in the day, I mean, to a certain extent. And they were built with the knowledge that the engineers and the, the planning and development sure. people and the local officials had at that time in history. And these, you know, uh, the infrastructure was built, the sewage lines were built, and now what's happened is you've had a tremendous growth in population in these areas. I mean, these cities and towns have grown in the thousands and you have all of these additional people all of these residents moving into these 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 areas and the, the populations have just become a lot more dense in these communities where the infrastructure was not originally intended to handle the amount of people that currently live in these communities so it just it does need an update but that is just a little bit of the history of why it's it's outdated and why the infrastructure you know it's old, it's outdated, it was originally intended for a much smaller population size. Right. Uh, you know, times have changed. Chemicals that we're using today are different. Uh, the, the technology that we have today and the way that we're treating our sewage is different. And the water levels have risen. Um, you know, uh, the, the debate on climate change is, is always had, right? Again, the debate on climate change can be had all day long, but what we do know is we do know that the water levels have risen in this area in order to create these sewage overflows. That's right. Every time there's more water and there's more rain, the water level rises, the sewage spills into the river, and we have to deal with the repercussions of that. Yeah. So, so again, this is going to take a, 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 a concerted and consistent effort. And this district commission, uh, you know, by no means, you know, is it is it an you know. Um, the, the saving grace necessarily for all of the issues that are impacting the river, but it's a really great start, Walt. It's a really great start, and it's something that's going to do a lot of good in connecting the experts and the officials in our communities and, and the advocates and residents who are concerned to make sure that their voices are heard, that action's being taken, 
and that it's consistently being taken when it comes to these short-term and yeah. long-term goals. Now, just uh, the, the, the statistic that I, I have is that 600,000 people get drinking water from the mayor. So in addition to the people that use it for, for recreation and fishing and, and boating and what have you, 600,000 people. Right. And I, I believe that the whole state of Vermont has less, uh, has around 500,000 people. So it goes to your point about how the population uh, has increased. Right. So tell us now, the, the, who comprises uh, the, um, um, the, the district commission and how do they meet and what, is, what exactly is their, is their charter? So the Marmac Valley Planning Commission is the facilitator and organizer of the group. Uh, Lane Glenn is the, you know, the president of the, the uh, commission at the moment. And the way that it works is local elected officials from throughout the region all along the Marmac River are invited to participate in uh, quarterly meetings right now is what we're having. It takes a lot of time to prepare these meetings. And what we'll do is everyone will get invited. It's open to the public. It's open to the press. Everyone will get invited, and there will be a slate of guest speakers and uh, conversation facilitators that end up coming out to these meetings. We end up breaking up after we hear from different presenters into small groups to discuss what we think about the proposal that was put on the table. For example, we had the Charles River Watershed Council come and speak recently at one of our local meetings, and they talked about how in the Charles River they have a flagging system, and that flagging system... Uh, allows for residents to know when they should be aware that there's been a sewage spill on the river and make the decision whether or not they want to go into the, the river that day. And they'll have a green flag or they'll have a red flag. And these flags are placed out on public beaches and public docks and allow for residents going to the beach, uh, to you know, going to these public access points to the river to make informed decisions and to understand the state of the waters. They say that it's been tremendously beneficial uh, as far as keeping the public updated, and they presented this to uh, the Merrimack River District Commission for our consideration. And after that was presented to us, we, you know, we break off into small groups, and we are allowed to have conversations about what we think about these things. And as part of those conversations, um, having been part of one of the small groups that broke off, I can tell you some of the things that came up were, you know, what about a reverse net? This, you know, the, the public flagging system is great, and that's what we got funding for to start a pilot program in Newburyport to see if we can model this for the entire state. Right. But what about a reverse 911 system where we can use an application for our phone, for example, an alert that will come up on our phone that says, by the way, there was a sewage spill. You might not want to go down to the river today. Because it's all well and good to have a flag at the river or down at the beach, uh, to make sure that when you get there, you know better than to go in the water. But isn't it better to know before you make that trip down to the beach with your children or with your dog or just by yourself to go swimming for the day before you make that trip to have access to that knowledge? And I think we can all agree that certainly it's better to have access to that knowledge earlier in the game before you make that trip down to the beach, right? So we talked about that, and that's something that's going to be included in this pilot program and that we're focusing on in this district commission. And we also talked about just having a website that can let people know about the, the state of the river, what's going on with the Merrimack River, and making sure that people can get access to information that they have an interest with by having that website up, up to date and by having resources available online for people to check out and to see how they can get involved. So these conversations are stimulated in these district commission meetings. And, um, you know, these guest speakers that come in, they really do provide some insight into some different things that we can consider. That was something that we can consider regarding this notification process. But then we have engineers come in, Army Corps of Engineers come in and talk about the real infrastructure updates that have to happen if we're going to stop the sewage yeah. spills. Uh, and tell us a little more we about that. We also discuss those things. Yeah, now tell us a little more about that. <laughs> uh, 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 have, have, uh, has anybody taken a pencil and paper and tried to put a, a number, a financial, how many dollars it would take to, to implement a total permanent solution to, to this problem? It's in the billions, and there have been conversations of the actual cost, but there are all different numbers that are being thrown out there, which is one of the points of this commission. Right now, there is an actual task force assigned specifically um, to do to lay out a strategic plan on what's going to be happening regarding those infrastructure updates that are needed moving forward. Their goal in this group, uh, we uh, 
or excuse me, not we, but the group contracted out with uh, an organization called Brown and Cald Brown and Caldwell, mm -hmm. uh, which is a planning design engineering firm. Right. And they have developed a strategic plan to find out these numbers, the actual numbers, to lay out an actual timeline uh, for how long these infrastructure updates should take and to set up a strategic plan for the local officials in our region and the advocates to follow in order to provide some guidance for moving forward to, to set out a plan. You know, what's the next step? We're here, we're developing these notification systems, but what's plan B? What's plan C? All mm -hmm. the way to Z mm -hmm. upon completion. Now you so we are looking at that right now and we are looking to hopefully hear back from that group that was contracted out with to do the strategic plan, hopefully by the summer so that we can start implementing immediately because we know we're going to start hearing from people as soon as it's swimming weather again uh... you know that the, the, the calls are going to start to come in about people who are concerned about this and have every right to be concerned about this and we want to make sure that we are able to update them with the plan uh, that is going to be in place moving forward. Yeah, and you mentioned you you emphasize the real costs and the real timelines, the actual ones. And, and, <coughs> and why do you emphasize that? Because uh, people uh, tend to uh, not give accurate information or underestimate. Or wh wh why? Tell us about well, that. Well, I'll tell you this. Um, we talk about the EPA, right, and how the EPA um, is responsible for making sure that these cities and towns are held accountable for allowing these sewage spills into the river. The cities and towns are looking back at the EPA saying, you know, we're trying our best. We're, you know, uh, doing all these infrastructure updates as quickly as we can. And the residents are looking at everybody saying, do your do job. Do something, yeah, exactly. Do your job and do it now. <laughs> we want a clean river, right? The issue and challenge comes when those tax increases start to occur, right, Walt? Because then, you know, uh, you get the calls, the calls come in. And again, this is happening at the city level. I'm a state legislator, so... Um, I'm not getting calls about people's water and sewage bills going up, but I can assure you that the local city councilors and the local mayors and town managers are hearing back when people's water and sewage bills are skyrocketing. And I know that uh, in a couple of the cities that I represent, that water and sewage bill has gone up tremendously by several percentage points in some of the communities that I represent, and that there has been conversation about why their sewage bill has raised so quickly and so sharply and drastically in the past couple of years and the response from elected officials locally has been we are doing these local infrastructure updates to make sure that the uh, sewage lines are updated enough so that yeah, we're not having these sewage stay ahead of the problems yeah um, I think about 30 to 33 million and I, I, I you know don't quote me on that but around 30 to 33 million from the last time I checked with um, one of the cities that I represent was how much they spent during the past year out of taxpayer dollars on um, just doing some upper updates over the last um, over the last several years yeah. um, on some of the right. some of the infrastructure updates. Now, it's not enough. It needs to continue. We need to make sure that we're doing these updates. But that is one of the challenges, and 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 that's one of the the issues. In, well. and, and challenges good, that, uh, good for you that and local, federal, and state uh, officials, advocates, and residents are facing when trying to tackle this issue. Right. And uh, I think with that, we've almost run out of time. Um, I'd like to thank my guest uh, today, State Senator Diane DeZoglio from Methuen. We've been talking about pollution in the Merrimack uh, River. Thank you for, for coming on the show, Senator. Thank you for having me, Walt. And uh, I'd like to remind our viewers that you have been watching North Shore Journal. I'm your host, Walt Kosmowski, and we'll see you next time.